Yeah, I'm Ron Loftus, as Steve mentioned. Um, I'm the technical support manager here for temperature division. I am located in American Fork, and I've been with Fluke Heart for about two years now. I originally started out in operations and moved to technical support about six years ago and really enjoyed it and enjoyed working with a lot of you out there. So, so. what we're going to be talking about today is, is maintaining your, your uh, heat source, whether a calibration bath, dry wells, or a micro bath. And I'll go through all three of these in this order. Maintain your calibration bath. The first end of life of the unit. As you know, these, these pieces of equipment are pretty expensive, and the repast on can be pretty expensive. So maintaining them and extending the life, life money, time, downtime, and it will help the measurements. Uh, clean the bass exterior, cleaning the condensing coil, replacing the controller's battery, checking for temperature cutout. Out, uh, selecting the right bath fluid, uh, ensuring proper ventilation, and, and uh, silicone polymerization, which is an interesting topic, and using uh, bath cleaning solvents. Cleaning the bath exterior. Um, why you want to clean the bath exterior, especially if you're using silicone oils? They have a tendency to build up debris uh, dust on top of it. And some of the times this debris will get down into the bath and can affect uh, the fluid, the viscosity of it, and, and uh, stability issues. So what we recommend is, is to wipe it down uh, periodically to keep that debris off there. We do recommend uh, spraying the, the clean solution directly onto the bath because you don't want it getting into your fluid and contaminating it. Uh, we do recommend that you uh, spray it into a cloth or a paper towel. Um, the type of uh, cleaning solvent that you should use is, is recommend is, is ethanol or O2 solvent, which I will discuss later in the, the presentation. That's a great one. It's readily available and, and cheap. I do not recommend using is like Windex or, or 409 on your bath because if the solvents get inside, the fluid, especially silicone fluid, it causes it to polymerize or essentially gel up. So, aware of, and that's why we do recommend you spray it on a paper towel, whatever you're using, so you don't contaminate the fluid. I wipe away all of the the silicone oil and debris from the top of the unit. Uh, I have a tendency on on the near the access opening to build up debris there. I also want to clean up condensation around the, the, the lid, too, as it builds up when you're using it at lower temperatures uh, to prevent water from getting into your, your bath fluids. And we'll, we'll discuss why here in a little bit. Um, so you want to just remove that access cover and wipe around the gasket, and that's just to keep debris from, from up there and have a good seal. So next next point we're going to talk about is cleaning the condensing coil. Uh, condensing coil is essentially uh, the heat transfer for your refrigeration system. Uh, how it works is is there's a fan behind the condensing coil, and you can see a picture of one here in the bottom corner. And it pulls air through that coil and dissipates the heat heat refrigeration system, which allows your your refrigeration system to work efficiently. There is debris that's built up on that condensing coil. It, it, it prevents the unit from operating at its peak capacity and it reduces its cooling capacity and can cause the U2 to not meet, reach its full range or stability issues. We do recommend that you set a schedule for, for cleaning the condensing coil fins. You will pressure compressed air directed downwards and blow lint dust out from the fins. Um, frequency of the cleaning depends on your, your laboratory environment. 
we've we've seen these units come in where that can coil is just so plugged up that it's causing the unit to not even reach its full temperature range. And really, all it needed was a, just a good cleaning. So it'll save you some time just to do this periodically, so you don't have to send it in for for repair or cleaning. So I have questions about your specific unit and how to access that cooling coil. You'll contact the technical support team, and I'll have their contact information at the end of this presentation. So here's kind of how you you would go through cleaning this. So here you can see the the cooling coil, and you want to the low compressed air and just spray downwards on those fins. Now your fins might become, and this will also restrict airflow and efficiency of the unit. And you can see the that are a little bit damaged, and use a, a, a film to straighten those out and clean them out. And then you just run it from top to bottom, straight up and down, and it'll straighten out those fins. And when you find those fin combs at, at most hardware stores, discuss about replacing your controller's battery. Controllers do use a battery to maintain the memory of, of the unit. Um, one symptom that the battery is dying is if you turn it on and then turn it on, the first indication that comes up is a, is a cycle count. Um, every time you turn that on, it is a one. That's a fair indication that your battery has died and that it needs to be replaced. And why battery is so important is because with that memory, it doesn't store any of your uh, calibration coefficients. So if you've made an adjustment to this unit and uh, that calibrate accuracy, or if you made a proportional band adjustment, every time that unit off, it would reset and go back to factory default. So it's important to, to keep an eye out for that. Um, look for that indicator. If it, every time you turn it on, it's one, then, then the battery more likely needs to be replaced. So it says the battery. Uh, you would need to remove the front panel of the unit. On the side of the panel, there's four screws, and the arrows are kind of indicating where they are. You would need to remove those. And then remove the lid. It can hang there by the cable. And then you can, you'll can you have access to the battery, and you can see it here. It's indicated by the arrow. Uh, volt, lithium battery, uh, replacing it, they're they're fairly common in um, see. So you want to use a flathead screwdriver just to kind of pop that battery up there. So to check it, uh, the battery must level must be above 2.8 volts. I had quite a bit of testing on this and found that that's, that's kind of the threshold. But if you've been getting close to the 2.8, I would recommend replacing it. They're, they're fairly inexpensive and easy to change out. Yeah, brand new battery should be around 3.3 volts, and the typical life expectancy of these batteries is right around seven to eight years. Item to check is the the cutout feature for these units. Cutout feature is a, a safety feature. If you have a a bath that has a low flash point, uh, you might say your your cow below that flash point to prevent any of a fire. Uh, the other option, if you have a probe that can go above a certain temperature, you can set this cut out. Uh, biggest safety issue with it is is the fluid. So to check this cut out, it should be tested about every six months or very minimal annually. The cut out you would just use you can go through the front display. So from the main temperature display, you'd want to press the set and exit buttons at the same time. It will come with a display power from set, and it'll show your proportional band. And then after, if you press set one more time, it'll have your, your cutout setting. Um, it's a temperature below what the, the unit's capable of reaching and below what the fluid you're using's flash point is. Um, you use 30 degrees if you're starting from room temperature ramp the unit up and, and see if it actually cuts out. You can tell if the unit's cutting out because it'll flash cut out on the, the display. Uh, pretty easy to reset. You would just press the set button and then you can go back following this, this, 
here and change it back to, to whatever you need it to be with your fluid. Uh, yeah, here's the, the process of doing it. Just one caution here with this is if you think the cutout, you do not want to exceed the, the flash point of your, your fluid. It can cause uh, harm or damage to the unit. So when cut out, it, it does cut out the the hairs um, or other cutout safety features that the unit does have that prevents it from going into a thermal runway. But, but there's for you guys to, to check that or adjust those ones. Those are done at the factory. Bath fluids. Uh, baths are kind of an interesting subject just because of the wide variety that are out there and available. And, uh, each one has kind of their unique plus minuses, um, unique features about them. So the first we talk about is halocarbon. Halocarbon has a, a pretty a, a wide usable range. The advantage with halocarbon is it's down to minus 100 degrees C. It's non-flammable. So one fluid that we most common fluid for lower temperatures is alcohol. The alcohol is it does it is flammable, but with halocarbon it's not. One downsides with it is it is fairly expensive. It does have a tendency at lower temperatures to absorb water, which affect the viscosity of fluid and how it performs in your unit. And I'll talk in the next slide a little bit about how the water will affect. Uh, your your fluid. The the next one is alcohol. Alcohol is, is great fluid um, for lower temperatures. There are two kinds out there: uh, methanol and ethanol that we recommend using. Um, so those has its, its plus and minuses. Um, it has a, the methanol is probably the better for lower temperatures because it has a tendency to absorb less water. But downside with it is it is hazardous and and you need to use caution when when handling the fluid, uh, latex gloves. So with ethanol works great down to the minus 80 temperature range, but, but uh, tendency to absorb a little bit more water and that that can affect the performance. Uh, um, another great fluid, it, it its usable range is is pretty limited. It's only rated down to minus 65. Uh, um, the plus with this one is is you can put uh, electronic components in there without damaging them. So there's a lot of users who, who do like to use it that way. As far as consumption, it its range is pretty limited with the 65, and it it, it does absorb water, but terrible. Ethylene glycol is a, is great fluid. It's it's relatively inexpensive. The big problem with that one is is it's it's temperature range is only rated down to minus 30, and, and the upper range is 90 degrees C. So it has, if you're working in that range, it, it works great. It's it's fairly inexpensive. Basalts, that's typically for our higher temperatures. Uh, its usable range is from 100 degrees C to 550. Good for that temperature range is. Uh, the only good thing about it is it doesn't off gas. There's there's not going to be any vapors coming off the the basalt. Uh, the oil typically we only see people use the mineral oil for for blister baths. Uh, we like to use the the mineral oil just to to maintain the temperature of the resistors. Uh, a really limited temperature range is is mostly on the upper end. Uh, the low temperature it's rated for is 10 degrees C. Uh, and that goes all the way up to 175. And silicone oil. Silicone oil is probably the most commonly used fluid just because of its wide range. There are a variety of silicone fluids out there. Um, based on it, it's fairly inexpensive compared to some. And temperature range is, is great. Uh, some downsides, and I'll, I'll talk about that here later. The downside with silicone oil that we see here is polymerization, and I'll, I'll discuss here a little bit. 
if you, if you want some more information on some of our fluids, we have a great article out there, and there's a link on this presentation. But site, and it's how to select calibration fluids, and there's a lot of good information on there about uh, viscosity and and the performance of each of these fluids. Talk about uh, build up in in your in your. So what happens is is you're running a, these units at lower temperatures, condensation will build up inside the unit and drip into the input. What they do is uh, have two effects on it. One is a little of the viscosity of the uh, causing it to become a little bit more thicker. As it's more thicker, it becomes harder to agitate, especially at lower temperatures. And the slides. Um, as the water builds up, it'll affect the thickness of it, and, and that'll affect your stability of, of and, and cause, um, especially say we see a lot of problems with it. The colder the fluid goes, the more water it's going to absorb. The other problem with water in your, your is it, it'll have a tendency to build up on the, the cling coils. Here's the picture of the ice building up on the, the side of the tank where the the, the clean coils are actually acting with the, the fluid. It'll have ice on it and it'll look like an insulator and it'll reduce the cooling capacity of your unit. Now, what do you do if you do have water buildup? Well, it kind of depends on what fluid you have. Some of the, the silicone oils, halocarbon, the good about them is if you, you turn on it and let it sit and run ambient temperature 25 your D, uh, the water will will float on top of the. Uh, you can just ladle it off, just kind of scoop it off of there. Uh, another option you can do is is to heat up the the wood to a, a higher temperature. Um, now, depending on the the temperature range of your fluid, you, you don't want to see the the max temperature. That it'll uh, uh, vary it off. The problem with doing that, especially with halocarbon, is the halocarbon will evaporate off almost as fast as the water. And the cup of carbon is, is pretty high, so I wouldn't recommend doing that. I'd recommend just uh, scooping the water off the top of the surface. Now, some of the other fluids like alcohol, there's really no good way to remove uh, the water from it. Uh, if you have water build up in there, uh, you'll see the fill, uh, building up on your cooling coils. We would just recommend uh, replacing it. I'm going to talk about is uh, uh, ventilation. So these fluids, uh, um, off gassing, you're going to have vapors coming off of the of fluid. And a ventilation system is is highly recommended, especially when you first see these fluids. Uh, they they have a tendency to off gas a little bit more. Uh, the salt, I said, it doesn't vaporize or off gas, but when you first start it up, there is some binding elements in there that will will burn off. And it will cause a smell and an odor. Um, with silicone oil, it's highly recommended that you have a ventilation system. Some of the gases that come off of that that, that wood are 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 toxin. So the yeah, system is an absolute must, and it doesn't it doesn't smell very good. So I recommend a, a 600 CFM fan with thin flex pipe. Yeah, and here we have a, a picture in our lab of, of the air duct and, and the ventilation pulling up there. One thing we've noticed with silicone oils is we'll have a tendency to have some of it build up in that upper duct. It's periodic, we'll have to go up there and clean it out. So, so the next subject I'm going to talk about is uh, silicone polymerization. Uh, interesting. Uh, how often this actually happens with customers? Uh, um, is time and usage. Uh, uh, the silicone oil will will tend to to long chains, and it actually just turns into a gel. And this can become uh, a terrible mess to to clean up. And you guys, you can see some pictures of it here. Uh, it, yeah, loud is 
time consuming and difficult to get all of it because it, it's it's in all of the cracks and corners. And he's had to deal with this and knows how big of a headache it can be. Um, now, silicone oil at higher temperatures it has have a tendency to polymerize faster. So, depending on your fluid, it's going to have different life expectancies. So here's a, a chart with something that we've done here and, and kind of monitor how, how fast it, it will polymerize. So, at least temperature at 300 degrees C, um, you're not looking at very many hours. I think the amount here is 480 hour and 10 fluid. But, um, and, egg, and it grows expansively, so you want to watch it. And if you can't track the time that you're using those fluids at those temperatures, and you're not using the bath at the higher temperatures, it's always a good idea just to to down to, to 25 degrees C and just to sit. And, and if you're not using the bath, just turn it off so it's not being agitated and just keep it covered and also extend the life of the fluid. Polarization does occur. How do you clean it out? Well, so some of it you can scoop out, but what we found that works really well is this OS2 uh, solvent. Alcorning makes it, and it's, it's available out there. It's available in a spray can, as shown here, but it's also available in one and five gallon containers. Um, you can pour the O2 solvent into the the silicone oil and it will eventually uh, break down so it becomes more of fluid. But the the OS2 solvent too is it's uh it breaks completely completely it doesn't leave a residue behind. So you can use this for cleaning the exterior of your bath. It works great if you want to use any at all. And if you do want to clean out the the so it's polymerized. You can use ethanol. It it works pretty good, but not as good as this OS2 solvent. So, okay, move on to to dry wells. A lot of the things are going to apply here to our dry wells. So, you know, why would you want to maintain a, your your dry well? They extend the life of the unit. These these units are also pretty expensive, and and it's your lab. Um, it prevents downtime, um, and the, the big thing with uh, dry wells is, is preventing uh, seized inserts. We have a question where a customer calls up and says, "Hey, insert stuck in my unit. What can I do?" Sometimes there's really nothing you can do. It's it's welded in there. Here's where we're going to go through uh, cleaning the interior of the, of the unit. Uh, cleaning the finger guard at the bottom of the unit, uh, maintaining the wells, and then checking the cutout. So the exterior of your dry wells is going to be similar to the, the wipe, wipe them with a uh, with the solvent. Now you're going to want to also spray the solvent on the on the cloth or the paper towel. Um, don't want to spray it directly onto it. You don't want to get any of the solvent inside the well of the, of the unit. Uh, the reason for that is it, is it can build up sides inside that well, and it'll seize your insert in there. Um, ethanol works great. Uh, it's a great product for for cleaning these units. It'll keep the dust off. Um, with these units, you can use a uh, Window nine, you don't have to worry about any of the fluids or contaminating those, but just make sure you don't get any of those in in the well of the unit. So you're going to want to keep the 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 well of the calibrator clean and and care of any format matter. Uh, so as I've said, do not use any fluids to clean out the inside of the well. Um, another thing that we've seen customers do is use thermal grease to help with uh, contact in the now was is it'll end up binding up that insert inside the 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 unit if if you with that and and you realize that you might ever get that insert out then then, then but 
uh, we've had a lot of customers that have sent their unit in saying, hey, this is bound up and we have to do a complete rebuild just because they were using thermal grease on their drum. So uh, inserting the inserts or probes, uh, do not twist the probe or the insert into the well. If you have burr or, or some sort of debris in there, that'll cause grooves in there, which will find up the, the insert. Um, now, the big the, the you want to if you're if you're not getting any fluids in there, and still finding that it's starting to stick or bind up is it's usually caused by oxidization. Now, this can occur in both the hot and cold dry wells. Uh, some of our dry wells use aluminum. You'll you'll still see some oxide build up there, and, and we'll also use uh, um, uh, that we use on our higher temperature ones that that will build up oxide. So to, to clean off your inserts, we do, you can take them out. Uh, we recommend that you clean them off to four grit sandpaper or Sprite works great. And we recommend it from top to bottom, just kind of send it off to clean off the inside that builds up there. Just so you get a nice shiny surface there. I uh, recommend doing that. It, it really depends on your usage, but every every six months to a year. Now, if you do drop a, a seed to, for any deformities before you actually put it back into the, the drill well, if you have a, a dent or divot in there, it, it can get bound on that dry well, especially as it heats up and it'll that insert to stick there. So item I'm going to talk about is actually cleaning the inside of the well. Um, sometimes I focus quite a bit on cleaning the inside, but not the, the actual well. So uh, what I do recommend is a gun cleaning kit or a pipe cleaning kit. Uh, readily available, but this this allows you to to well um, clean that are building up in there, and a lot of cleaning kits can come with cotton. Uh, on them that you can run down and wipe out any debris. Can use a, ethanol in there. Just make sure it's a high purity ethanol to to clean out the well if if you miss. But really, just running a cotton to find. Checking the cut out on the the dry wells is, is fairly important. Some of our dry wells have a temperature range and. You might have a probe that you do not want to exceed a, a, a thermistors come into mind. I mean, their max temperature is usually 100 degrees C, and if you take them above that, it destroys a probe. So with these units, it, they all have a, a function that allows you to set the cutout to a lower temperature than what the unit's capable of. It's fairly similar to the refrigeration bass. From the thin temperature display, you just press the set and exit buttons at the same time. Yeah, it'll come up and show the the displayed power. From there, press set, and it shows the proportional band, and then set again, and then it has the cutout temperature. So it's similar to what the pass are. You're gonna want to set it to or below its maximum set point on the or temperature range of the unit. Just make sure that the unit cuts out. It'll just display cut out on the on the front display. Ecology wells have a little bit different um, cut out uh, as the some of our legacy dry wells. Uh, just on the main temperature display, you just press the exit button and it comes up with the cutout function. Um, you can manually just set the, the temperature to whatever you want, and then they also enable and disable the unit. I'm going to do that. Set it to a, a temperature that's below its maximum capability and make sure that it, it cuts out. On those, it'll flash cut out on the, the display. So we'll talk about microbass. It's Kind of a high to dry well mineral. Uh, with these, you have some of the 
goods of the drywall then of the bass uh, used to deal with fluids here in the micro bass so, the the micro bike exterior this we're going to cover um, adjusting the stir motor speed uh, changing the stir bar and avoiding using water in the 7102 micro bath So have some of the same features as the best. Uh, be sure to spray uh, solvent directly onto the unit. Do it to a, a paper towel to wipe it off. Uh, the most fluid for the micro bass is definitely silicone oil, and it'll build up a, quite a bit of debris on top of that. So periodically wipe that off and, and keep it clean. Uh, they have vents on the side. Of them, make that there's no debris build up there. You're going to want to, it's, it's important to they have airflow in there. And debris will, will, will hinder and, and cause poor performance on the unit. Our units, they have a, for best, they have a fan on the, the body unit. Um, this fan pulls air upwards and through the unit, which will to perform ranges of that it does. This fan have a tendency to build up debris um, underneath there, so you make sure that that's cleaned off. Uh, otherwise, it will hinder the performance of the unit. And is debris sometimes can blown up there, and it gets caught up in the the sinks of the unit, then it'll cause for poor poor performance. With these micro bass, you can adjust the stir motor speed of the unit. Um, this is for used with different fluids. Uh, different fluids have different viscosity, and and the stir bar might work or perform depending on how how fluid is. So the stir speed might need to be adjusted. I uh, uh, how you access the stir speed setting in the the menu. Uh, for display temperature, you want to press the set and exit button. This takes you into the secondary menu. Uh, there will be what you know, and you're going to want to press set. Uh, proportional band will be shown, and then press set again. And here you also have your, your cutout temperature. And then press set one more time, and it gives you your operating parameters. And then from there, it'll lead to your stir speed. Here I have the, the default settings for the stir or for each unit's stir speed. I'm um, using these. These tend to work with the fluid we recommend. On the that we recommend for each model, but like I said, it, it will have to be adjusted depending on on your fluid that you're using with them. So our bus use a, a stir bar, a magnetic stir bar inside of them to agitate the fluid. Um, we did so we'd have a, a sealed well with flow coming into the the, the well, um, which would make it susceptible to leaks. So they use magnetism. Um, the problem with the stir bar, though, is, is they will lose their magnetism over time and usage. And so as they lose their, their magnetism, uh, They'll start to be thrown off to the side, or they won't stir stir properly. When using this, we do recommend that you you replace it. It's tricky to to get out of the well. We recommend a metal rod, maybe with a magnet stuck on on the end of it, um, or a tongs to reach down in there. Uh, some of our units, there is a, a little bar that goes across the bottom well. Be not to, to hit or damage that. A sensor for the unit is located there. Uh, here on this unit that's displayed, it's a 6102, and the bar that goes across there. Um, sensor is, is here, or bent. It, it can cause bad rings on your display. It's not easy to replace. talk about is uh, the 7102. Uh, 7102 is kind of a unique 
unique unit because it has an aluminum block and and a steel basket that's used inside of it. Um, now the the Welsh unit we we do paint, but what happens is the paint will extend uh, um, the aluminum and you add water into this unit while while you have the steel basket in there. It creates a, essentially a battery. And the water becomes extremely corrosive in there, and it'll eat through that tank. We don't recommend using water in the 7102. Um, if you use water, I recommend using a 50 one to one with ethanol. That prevent uh, some of this battery effect from happening. But ideally, I mean, silicone oils. What these units are work with us and that's what we test them with here at the factory so but occasionally where, where people use want to use water with them but we just do not recommend it with the 7102. All I have today I, I just want to introduce the the technical support team uh, which I'm a, a member of uh, and you might have spoken to to one of us so there's uh, Shane Aldrich he's been with us for I want six to eight years and Al Snyder, and he's been here for about 10 years. And then myself, um, we, we've had a good on work with a lot of you out there, and it's a pleasure. Um, to contact us, uh, you can email us. We have a group email box, and it's just temperature support at flucal.com. Or you can call in, and there's our phone number there. And we're always happy to talk to you guys. And question. Okay, thanks for that presentation. We're ready now to take questions. If you have questions, please text those uh, to the chat window and we'll pick up now. And uh, as the presentation was going on, some of you mentioned that you couldn't see the slides. I apologize for that inconvenience. I'm not sure if it's the internet or our, um, our hosting service. I'll be checking with them, see if there was a problem on their side. Uh, keep in mind that I, I did record the presentation and uh, I'll be sending out a link to that recording on Friday along with the presentation slides. So it like we've got any questions, Roman. So I guess we'll go ahead and wrap up. If you want to go to the next slide. Let me just... Uh, oh, we did have one come in here. Let's see. Back one. Question, Roman. Um, we need to calibrate thermocouples at minus eighty degrees C. Do you have any liquid or temperatures below ninety degrees C? And what liquid should we use in that case? We. Uh, a new dry well that's out. If you if you don't want to avoid using uh, 190, that is down to minus 95 degrees C. Uh, the problem with that one is is it is a dry block, and, and a lot of thermocouples have unique shapes on them. So to have good thermal contact in the 9190 might be a little bit difficult, but it's a good option for that temperature. Um, Really, the only fluid that we have available would be halocarbon. The difference with that, though, is the minus 90 is to reach right now. All of our main production units that only go down to minus 80. We do have a unit that we sell as a custom unit. It's a 7100. It is rated down to minus 100. And, and if you have some more information on that, uh, and we, we have one of our sales reps talk to you about that and get you some more information on it. But the 7100 is great, and the the carbon would be the fluid that you're going to be using for for that temperature. Another question. Uh, um, Chilled water is used in a 7102 micro bath and then drained right afterwards. Would they be acceptable? Or does the ethanol mix help uh, dramatically? The ethanol mix helps. Uh, 
the biggest look is to watch your, your to make sure that they're the paint still in contact. The real is when the aluminum is exposed and inside the the well. So you can use the old water in there. Uh, yeah, just pour it out and clean out the tank if if fine. If you're not a long period of time. Okay. Another question from Doug is wondering if we could take a question on portable thermal couple calibration instruments. If you want to text in, Doug, we can we can give a try. Okay. So here's a question. Um, for example, the Fluke 724 type instrument, are there any factors that would cause it to go out of al calibration sitting on the shelf? Um, you have some reference resistors in there that can drift. Something on the shelf, it 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 will drift over time. It it will be fairly minimal. But you never know how your unit is going to perform with unless you're actually calibrated and tested. Period. Okay. Uh, those are we've answered all the questions, Roman. So. We're going to uh, try a really different topic. Uh, it'll be more of an open forum where we'll have um, Mike Coleman, our uh, tetralogist, and we'll be talking about uh, temperature measurement. So he'll go over some common questions that he receives and then bring questions. Uh, anything you want to know about temperature measurement, you can ask those uh, to Mike in that forum. Then May 20th, we'll do uh, in Spanish the first part of our thermocouple calibration uh, series on how to set up a thermal calibration system. We did that earlier in English, so if you missed that, it's recorded and it's uh, available on our website where you could uh, see that re recording. And they've all, all so want to throughout the offer temperature calibration courses, our next one will be on uh, principles of temperature metrology, June uh, uh, 9th to 11th. And then in the fall and September, we'll do advanced topics in temperature metrology. So if you're interested in further training on temperature calibration, please uh, please register for those classes. Once again, uh, to Roman for this presentation, for your attendance. Hopefully this information has been useful to you. Uh, once again, apologize for the inconvenience about, for the couldn't see our slides. I'll be sending out um, a link to the recording and the presentation slides on Friday. And um, we'll sign up for now and hope to have you attend one of our future web seminars. Uh, thank you. Bye.